Welcome back to the Flex the Diet podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, where we focus on how to increase your performance and body composition, all without destroying your health in a flexible approach. Today in the program, my good buddy, Kyle Dobbs of Compound Performance, and we talk all about exercise sequence. Uh, what are different ways and ideas, thoughts, methods, for programming exercise over the course of a week, month, or even longer. Uh, what are things you should consider, uh, things that go into uh, the thought process? And what was interesting is we didn't necessarily compare notes directly on this, and we both kind of ended up in a, a very similar area. And as always, this podcast is brought to you by... This time, the Flex Diet Certification, hence the name, Flex Diet Podcast. So the Flex Diet Cert will open again for the last time this year, coming up on Monday, October 18th, 2021, and it'll be open for a week until October 25th, 2021. If you want more information on that or to enroll during that time period, uh, you can even get on the wait list ahead of time. Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. If it's before that period from October 18th through the 25th, you'll be able to get placed onto the wait list there. So as soon as it comes out, you'll be notified. And I usually tend to do a fast action uh, gift for those on the newsletter also. So check that out. Go to flexdiet.com. It will be open from the 18th through the 25th of this month. If you're listening after that time frame, you can still get on the wait list for when it will be open next year. So enjoy this conversation with my good buddy, Kyle Dobbs of Compound Performance. Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. And I'm here with my good buddy, Mr. Kyle Dobbs. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Always a pleasure. Yes. And we are uh, not stranded on the side of a road in Costa Rica in a vehicle you were driving. So this is pretty easy. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've gotten a lot of flack for that vehicle, but I feel like I, I was set up to fail uh, with that. And then they gave us a, a car on empty and then it literally caught on fire on the side of the road. And, and that's uh, that was an interesting day to, to say the absolute least. Yeah. And you know, you're screwed when to get out of the parking ramp, you have to speak Spanish and you're relying upon my Spanish. So that was our, that was the, the first thing where things were not going well. <laughs> it, it was, it was a tense, like 10, 15, 20 minutes just to get out of the parking garage at the airport. It was <laughs> like, I circled it twice. The, the security guards finally pulled us over. No one understood what was going on. Uh, it was, it was definitely, um, yeah, it, it it's funny looking back. It wasn't funny at the time. Yeah, and then of course it's on a main freeway in Costa Rica, and after a while we're like, I think we should maybe move away from the car because if it gets hit by all these vehicles doing like a hundred miles an hour, it's just going to take us right out with it. <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> I think that was the biggest thing is if you've never, I mean, again, like very few people probably listen to this have driven down there, but like the, the shoulders for the highways are like half the size of like a oh, yeah. highway shoulder that you would see here in the States. And there's really no, I mean, there's a speed limit, I guess, but there's really no speed limit that, that's happening like on, on the freeways. People just kind of go as fast as they can. And yeah, like we had like semis going back, like, I mean, chicken trucks, cars, people yelling at us and hawking the horns at us. It was, it was definitely interesting. And then we had the, the fire ant hill that we were yeah. also parked next to. Did, which, which did you or did our Irish friend sit on that? I think Rua was the one who <laughs> was like uh, on the hill and like felt them like, like found, like discover them crawling up his legs. Basically. <laughs> we realized the entire si hillside was basically one huge ant nest hill, whatever. So it was, it was it was yeah. interesting good times good times yes yes and so for people who may not know you do you want to give a little short introduction on yourself there 
Yeah. So I got into training kind of straight out of college. I was a, a collegiate athlete who was injured all the time. Like I am the cliche of uh, <laughs> a failed athlete that turned into a strength coach because they were trying to fix themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and None of that in the industry. There, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not 90% of the people here. Um, so that, so that was me. Um, and I moved to New York straight out of school, um, with my, my then girlfriend, now wife and started training at a, like at a Globo type gym in the middle of Manhattan and quickly found out that I was working with zero athletes and, and really had to kind of reframe my own thought processes around training. And, that kind of steered my education a little bit more into, you know, at that point, the, the FMS and the SFMA, and then I got into DNS and FRC and PRI and a bunch of other stuff in between. Three letter um, acronym world. All, all of the acronyms, as many <laughs> of them as I could take over the course of the time. And um, eventually got into management and found my way up to, you know, district and regional manager positions, and then went into more of the the private sector as far as like personal training facilities and, and worked at peak performance for a little bit as their personal training director. And then that kind of exploded and I ended up moving back to the Midwest because I have kids and it's New York's a, a very expensive and challenging place to raise kids. Oof, uh, and, I can only imagine. It, it was, it's a lot. And, peak and the, was like right downtown. I mean, I was there, did some consulting with them briefly and yeah. Yeah, super interesting location, but I can't imagine having a family in that area. It, it was it was it was rough, you yeah. know. It, it just <laughs> this from an experience perspective and a financial perspective. It, it was oh tough. sure, and, and then um, yeah. So we've been back in the Midwest now for just over four years. I think we celebrated our four year last month, and. I've been, I started my own business. So I've been the, the owner operator of compound performance for about three and a half of those years. And yes, we've, ta I've taken on a business partner, Matt Domney and, and a couple other employees in that time. And over the course of last year, we worked with about a thousand coaches and clients total within all the stuff that we do. And um, it's been really fun and, and definitely challenging, but fun of full, you know, full of fun challenges as well uh, from an entrepreneur standpoint. So and you're primarily helping the coaches with, I'd say, integration of things, developing systems, or how would you kind of phrase it? That's me yeah. looking as an outsider kind of looking in. That, that's a pretty good perception of it. You know, we, we do large groups, and then I work with people more individually on the consulting. And, and the large groups are definitely more about helping people kind of take the information that they already have coming into the program and their experiences, you know, the, the demographics they work with, the facilities and the environments they work within, kind of what those task goals are going to be based on, you know, the, the biases that are then occur within those places and building out a model that, that works for them. You know, so we, we give our model and it, which is obviously always, always changing and evolving. We kind of tell, you know, tell them what we're doing and, and what and why and, as an example, and then really encourage them to kind of critically think about their own processes and what makes the most sense for them. Um, and leveraging those things as best as they can to help the people that they work with. You know, we, we realize that, you know, especially after, you know, all those acronyms, like I found it, <laughs> uh, they all kind of work, you know, it, given the right, given the right context and application and, and they can, you can help people with all of them. So we don't really bias our materials but you're supposed towards. to be in one camp only right isn't I, I that know. the deal it's, that is the deal that I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm very apolitical on that, on that front now and it, it's it's controversial uh, apparently so, so everybody hates you I, they do that's, that's where it's like you're loved <laughs> by nobody uh, i'm everybody's enemy and yeah so we just try to steer people into you know what they bias what they enjoy doing and what's going to help the the people that they work with the most and building a a really coherent model based out of that, that they can help, you know, not only from a training perspective, but we cover service models uh, and then business models on top of that as well, to make sure that they kind of have a good, like holistic plan of action as they go into, you know, managing and operating their own businesses. Cool. That's awesome. And the topic today is a little bit related to that, but how do we blend sort of aerobic training with strength training? I'm, I'm, my own phrasing, I'm trying to get it away from saying anaerobic because it doesn't really exist, which is a whole nother topic in general. So I'm trying to change my own, 
vocab without being one of those weirdos that's demanding the whole world follow what I'm doing. But, you know, classic cardiovascular type training with, you know, meathead strength training stuff. Yeah. And we're kind of on the same track, you know, and we've, we've been talking to Evan Pycon quite a bit. Yeah, about I love Evan. Yeah. And he's kind of, you know, reintroducing that, that newer model, I should say, or, or branch off of kind of that old, you know, the, the old graph that we've, we've always seen covering, you know, the, the, the classic, you know, PCP and glycolytic and, and aerobic and whatever. And Come on, Kyle, you're only using carbohydrates and there's no use of oxygen none, up till about no. 20 or 30 seconds, <laughs> you just, which is actually you, not true. <laughs> you hold your breath and you hope for the best. Right. And, right. You know, so we're, we kind of do the same thing and we've actually just been the, the way that I kind of look at it in, in my own training and what I'm working with, with the athletes that I, I currently train is more so looking at like stimulus exposures where we can look at uh, intensity and duration, you know, relationships and, and based on what somebody's actual goal is, kind of moderate throughout the course of like a, a, a micro cycle, even sometimes a bi-weekly cycle, depending on what they're doing, different exposures to kind of high stem, moderate stem and low stem and kind of correlating those with um, just, again, giving them, you know, different ways to express outputs, you know, and then from a kind of blending the strength training in the same way around those things where we've got high days and, and moderate days and low days. So it's, it's almost like, a Charlie Francis, like high, low model, except we've kind of introduced kind of that moderate day buffer uh, in between yeah. the two as well as we kind of go through like a, like, you know, typically a, a one week cycle, but sometimes a, a biweekly cycle as well, depending on who we're working with. And it's, it kind of ensures the way that we set it up that you're never piggybacking, you know, high days on top of one another. And you always kind of, you've got either a moderate day or a low day kind of mixed in between those two. And um, so far, so good. But, but again, you know, it's evidence-based, so who knows? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what would like a high stim day kind of look like for reference for someone who's listening? Like what would be kind of a, an example of that? And then would you, I know Cal Dietz has talked about this. Like, I think God, was it four or five years ago? I could be wrong. He moved his models around where I think he moved the high day to earlier in the week instead of later in the week and then did like high low and then medium or high medium low i think instead of having them flip-flopped and he noticed a, a bigger difference and his theory was right because of college students that you know sunday is probably a more moderate off day for them so monday is probably going to be a little bit better instead of pushing that to later in the week when they already have more uh fatigue just from the week and everything else they have going on yeah when i think that's a super important point to make because I do think the demographic that you're working with and what they're, you know, obviously what their lifestyles are, or, or even like working with collegiate athletes, like they typically have like Saturday games, like Friday, Saturday yeah, games and a Sunday totally. day and, and working in. So that's always going to be a little different aspect of things. And I do think that's a consideration when you're setting up what a week looks like for somebody, like you have to know what that weekend actually looks like for people. And, and kind of from a gen pop perspective, it's like, you kind of, you need to know if your client's like day drinking all day on Sunday. Like if, if you're, if you're working in like a New York environment, oh, it's like, like three football games Sunday, man. Yeah. Or like <laughs> you, you go to brunch, you watch a couple of games, you're, you know, whatever. And it's like, you have to kind of accommodate Monday accordingly based off of that, or they need to accommodate Sunday based off of your Monday session. And depending on who the client is, you kind of have to figure out which scenario is going to be best, you know, for them, you know, and, that gets into again, like adherence and coherence and behavior change. And that's, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But what I, what I look at is, you know, that, that high day from a strength training perspective is typically going to be, if I'm breaking down things categorically into patterns, like I'll typically look at Monday as a primary squat day. And from there, you know, that, that would be, you know, high, high intensity, low volume. So I would, I would be looking at like sets of like threes to fives. Typically for me, I don't get into singles and doubles that often based on my goals now, but th those would be hyper and higher intensity subjective to what, to what I'm typically doing. And then from a accessory perspective, like that might be where, depending on the phase I can throw in like a secondary hinge and then I can throw in like tertiary upper body work, you know, ba based off of that, where I'm looking more at variability and more maybe even capacity based stuff from, from, uh, uh, an accessory perspective, you know, at that point. And, 
And the hinge stuff is going to be, you know, we look at, we kind of classify those by muscular orientations as well. And this would vary by, by who you're, who you're working with, where like my, my hinge primary would be like a hybrid would be like a trap bar where I'm looking at more of a, a neutral orientation of like hamstring glute complex. And my secondary, because I struggle with lengthened hamstring positions might be like an RDL where I really mm. want to drive being able to kind of control, especially trying to get into running my myself as someone who's kind of chronically overextended. Like I have a hard time in like early to mid stance transitions. Like I don't find my heels super well lengthened hamstring positions, especially with eccentric loading. I have a hard time controlling. So that might be where that, that RDL is something where I'm really trying to drive a good stimulus for to kind of create that adaptation and, and competency yeah. within that. And, and then you're a rather first, tall fellow too. So you yeah, got longer so got, legs, longer I torso, that, that kind of stuff too. Right. So and then my tertiary hamstring might be like my hamstring curl where I'm looking at like a short position. And, you know, so my, my Monday is going to be like that primary squat, secondary hinge, tertiary upper body. And then I'll usually piggyback that with a moderate intensity um, uh, conditioning day where I might run like tempo repeats of like, you know, 400s at a mile pace or something of that nature where it's like, um, I can do very, a very controlled amount of, you know, say six to 10 rounds of that, and then piggyback that onto some GPP or like LICT based conditioning. If I want to get a little bit of zone two in, and then my Wednesday, I'll typically do So the cardio like, stuff. Is that Tuesday or is that on Monday also? That would be a Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. I, I, Got it. I separate that makes sense. them as much as possible. Yeah. And, that was my, my question. Part of that is just my competency and capacity limitations, probably where I can't mm -hmm. do, you know, both very well on the same day. And then Wednesday, I would be looking at like a more moderate strength training day where that's where, and especially for me, it's like, that might be where I go a higher stem upper body day and rest the legs with like a, with like tertiary lower body work or even none. So I might have like my, my bench day is, is my primary. And then I've got a, like a secondary, uh, push or pull. And then I've got tertiary lower body where maybe I'm doing something just like a, a front foot elevated, you know, back lunge or something where I'm just working through a range of motion. It's very sensorial based. It's very, maybe even more like stability based. I'm not really biasing strength too much, just trying to get the blood pump in, get a little bit of work in. And then on that Thursday, that's where I will go high intensity with the conditioning. And that's where I'll run, I'll do sprints, maybe some HICT work on that, maybe a little prowler work piggybacked onto that as well. And then Friday, it's it ends up being a little higher stem because that's where I usually do my hinge. But because I'm tall, I hinge way better than I squat. So hmm. I recover pretty well. Yeah, from, buddy. From, from trap bar I don't know deadlifts. anything about that. Yeah, it's especially trap bar. Like trap <laughs> bar, like I can I can max out and or do something really capacity based and really push the limits and not feel it at all the next day from yeah. a recovery perspective. And so I'll do like a primary hinge on that day. So it ends up being moderate to high a little bit. And then I can kind of, again, run kind of that, that's maybe secondary squat, tertiary upper body again. And then I'll do my, my lower intensity, longer duration conditioning work on Saturday and, and kind of cycle those things through. And that based on what phase I'm in and, and kind of what my focus is like that can obviously be a little more fluid, but that would be kind of what a, a week breakdown might look like. Oh, that's super cool. That's funny. We didn't really compare notes on this ahead of time, but that's pretty similar to how I program for myself and for clients, right? So in general, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe Saturday, depending upon what they're doing is, you know, some type of strength based stuff. Mm -hmm. I try to take the total load and split it out as much as I can over the course of a week. Although I have found that like having just an upper body, more focused day, I normally for clients, I'll drop in on like a Wednesday yeah. seems to work pretty good. And I don't know if that's just lowering systemic fatigue or, or what, but I find that a lot of people can't handle completely full body or even just like a lot of squats, a lot of deadlifts, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, that usually tends mm -hmm. to be a little bit too much. Um, and then Tuesday, Thursday, <clears throat> Saturday is some type of aerobic, you know, conditioning. One of those days, maybe high intensity, depending upon what, what they're doing. 
And then, yeah, my training is pretty similar. Like Mondays, I moved upper body stuff too, because that's just like a higher priority day and I've got more time in my schedule. Yeah. And then Tuesday, cardio. Wednesday is you know, some type of hybrid, you know, type full body thing. Thursday is conditioning. Friday, I'll do a mix, a little bit more upper body, a little lower body. And then Saturday, I'll normally do a very heavier squat based routine. Sunday's off and then kind of repeat again. So yeah. for my schedule, it's, it's very similar. I found that if I squat on Saturday, like even to come back Monday right away and do lower body or even deadlift stuff is just not quite enough rest. So for my mm -hmm. stuff, I moved my upper body stuff to Monday and Sunday is usually a complete day off. And so I found that that worked pretty good too. So, yeah, that's the squatting takes it out of me, you know, and again, yeah. like, we're, <laughs> and, and that's something that we always consider with, with clients, especially like, like Matt works with a bunch of power lifters and, and he'll have people who are, you know, shorter and more compact with, with shorter arms. And it's like their deadlift day takes it out of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And their squat mm -hmm. days are totally fine. And, and I think that's something we really try to understand as we're working with people, just from a morphological perspective and from a training history perspective, like most people are kind of biased towards one of those more so than the other. And it's like, I've always been a better puller than I've been a squatter. So yeah, me too. For, for me to load up the squats um, and, and get a pretty, pretty high stimulus there, like I'll feel it for the, for the next few days. And that's where even like on Tuesdays, like if I'm doing those, that moderate duration, uh, you know, training, like I'm, I might be able to like hit treadmills, like, repeats on that but if i'm feeling super beat up that's where i just hop on an assault bike and, and i kind of call you know i'll call it and say like hey like i can get in the conditioning stimulus that i want from that perspective but i don't have to do like the impact of actual running right and kind of kind of save the quads and the knees a little bit from that perspective and hop on a bike and and feel good about it and just drive the adaptation a different way uh, but i can keep the you know again the set rep scheme intensity scheme whatever kind of the same. And I'll just kind of have a Watts marker or something of that nature as I go through those repeats. And, and that's where, you know, from a, like I'll, even with clients, like I'll usually give them the autonomy to kind of do that based on what their bias towards conditioning is. Cause not everybody I work with is a runner. Um, like I've got some people who like, they're going to row. I've got some people they are going to help on the bike or use a ski or I've got one person who loves Versa climbers because they hate themselves. Like I was say, who loves a Versa climber? I, like it's, that's it's, worse than the rower and the assault bike. And there's not you, much that's worse than a rower and an assault bike. You find some <laughs> sick people in this industry sometimes. And, you know, so it's like, they'll, Oof. they'll be, you know, playing with different stuff. And if I'm just looking at an exposure and intensity exposure, that allows me to, you know, kind of decrease the specificity of whatever modality they're doing where I can say like, Hey, yeah. I don't need you to run on this day, or I don't need you to do to row. If you want to do the bike, if it feels better to do that or whatever, cause I'm just looking for that output. I don't really care how you, you know, the, I don't necessarily care about the vehicle to the output because you're not a specificity based client. If I've got somebody who is looking to run better, all I'm looking at is over the course of that week that we get it at least two of those sessions, we probably need to be running. The third one, um, we might be able to mix in with something else and cross train it a little bit if you're feeling beat up. And, and that's where I'll give them a little bit of autonomy as far as like what that looks like uh, on their end. Cause everybody I'm working with is remote. So they, they're already doing it on their own from that perspective. Do you think the um, <clears throat> reason squats are more of an impact or deadlifts for other people is the spinal loading like i've thought a lot about this and it you generally i find that if people have longer femurs longer torso like even if their mechanics are good like squats tend to be much more draining for them like the hrv will be altered usually for a couple of days after where people like my buddy sam pogue who claims he looks like a south park character he can squat a lot and it doesn't bug like, I don't see a drop off in his recovery all that much. I've just noticed that sort of, I guess, trend over time. I don't know if you've seen something similar. I haven't looked at it from an HRV perspective, but, but definitely just, Even just from, a programming perspective, right? Yeah, you know what the just, performance is the next day. Yeah. Just from like, when I look at taller people, especially taller people with longer legs and shorter torsos, like 
it's almost impossible to get like a fairly vertical squat with that person. Like you really, yeah. like you've got to front load and you've got to heel elevate them. And depending on what their goals are, like, like I love heel elevated squats for a lot of clients, but I hate them for myself because they actually end up being detrimental to a lot of my running because I don't get the, like the tibial ER and dorsiflexion that, that I need on them mm. uh, because of the elevation they've actually, <laughs> I don't want to say done more harm than good, but they haven't been as beneficial as, as maybe they are for other people. So I've been doing more flat foot anyway. Um, but you're going to be hingier. Like you're going to have more of a forward lean uh, just because you can't change your femur length and you can only stick right. your knees out so, so far forward. So your butt's going to have to go back a little bit. And when you have people who are a little shorter and have, and, you know, they don't have to deal with moving around femurs and they can typically get their knees forward enough to drop their hips a little farther back. And, and I think that does change the way you are loading again, especially the axial skeleton, right? Cause you're more vertical. You are right. going to have less surface area, so to speak, of where that tension's hitting the way that I've gone around it is, is, or my solution to it, I should say the best one I found is I do a ton of Hatfield squats now. Yeah. Those are great. And, yeah, Explain what that, that is that, if people are not familiar. Yeah. So it's, you have to have like a, a yoke bar or an SSB, right? So you, you've got it kind of balanced on your shoulders. You're not holding the handles. Um, and then you've got pins or actual handles or a bar on the rack that you're kind of using to maintain your, your balance and be able to create more of an upright torso. So it kind of takes the axial loading out of the squat and I kind of end up being able to, I mean, I can load it. I can load a, a hat field, like easily 150% of what I would do a normal SSB at. Yeah. I've noticed like too. It, I can go way heavier, higher reps. It's a significant <laughs> difference. And, and that tells me that for, for the most part, like when I look at my SSB squat, like my limiter isn't my legs, it's my torso strength. Mm -hmm. right? Basically, more than anything else, it's my ability to stabilize, you know, my my torso. So that kind of takes it out of it, you know, and you can you can cheat it. Like I've seen people that are definitely using their arms a lot to, to pull yeah. up. But you know, so you, you gotta have a little bit of uh, efficacy when when you do them. Mm -hmm. But but even with um, like some of our strength athletes, like Matt uses those with the, with his power lifters in the off season too, when they're more into a variability based program to overload eccentrics. Oh, sure. For, for them where it's like, he can really like, cause you get to a point where like some of these guys are so strong. It's like, okay, you got a 750 pound squat. Like, what am I supposed to do with you? That's not yeah. going to be like, so systemically just draining mm -hmm. and he'll be able to give that person half fields at a pretty, at a pretty low, you know, a pretty significant weight, but the systemic strain isn't nearly as high and he can overload the eccentric and, and just give him, give him like eccentric tempos on a half field, which is really crappy. Like, like those yeah, are, those not are fun. <laughs> those are zero fun if, if you're controlling them with your, with your legs. And, but I've been using them because it's as a tall guy, it's like kind of a secret weapon to be able to really drive my legs without my, my upper body or my, my torso being a limiter from that perspective. And I can, I can get a pretty good stimulus that way. And then, um, I've been super happy with them, uh, as far as that goes. So have you found you can bring your stance in and be more almost parallel straight instead of externally rotated out just to use common terms? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Like I can, like I can set those up at probably like armpit. Like I like to call it kind of armpit width where it's not necessarily like yeah. straight, straight hip width, but it's, it's also not shoulder width. It's kind of in the middle there and, and get my feet fairly forward in, um, get my knees forward because of that, instead of kind of scooting them out. And, and that's again, the, because I have something to kind of hold against a little bit. Um, it, it enables me to, to get pretty solid depth for me, you know, with that and work through kind of that full, full knee flexion range of motion, which again, as someone who's had like multiple knee injuries over the years, like being able to train those tissues is something that I, I, I try to prioritize as much as possible too, at this point, just to, for longevity sake. Yeah. I found that too. Like I can usually tell in my programming, if I'm doing 
too much stuff with my, my feet kind of in that external 45 degree position, which again, I don't think is wrong. I don't think it's bad. No. Um, but whatever position you train in, you are going to build up adaptations to that Mm -hmm. position. And so I can go for a fair amount of time doing that, like on a safety squat bar, get pretty good depth. But at some point, if I really start pushing it, I have to bring my feet in more straight and start loading that position more. So like lately I've been using, um, a trap bar with like the wagon wheels. So it's like a 16 inch yeah. pick. So it's, yeah. I find the higher <clears throat> up I go in a pole, I can get my feet more straight. The lower I start dropping the bar, I need to get that external rotation to get enough depth to put my hips in the, the right position. Yeah. So I find by playing around with those, that seems to solve it literally within like a couple sessions, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I, I haven't, I'll do barbell with, with like RDLs and, mm-hmm. and get, but with trap bar with like my primary deadlift now, I mean, for years I've been pretty much exclusively been, been using a trap bar and I do high handle even with that because I, I don't care. Like I'm not worried about yeah. arbitrary, like height marker at that point. I'm not a power lifter or competitor. And, and that allows me to like for deadlifts, like because the knee flexion isn't as much of a, of an issue there. And I don't have to worry about balancing femurs as much. Yep. Like that's where I will be like pretty narrow. Like I'm at hip width when I do those and, and that yeah. feels super good for me. And, um, and yeah, with the, I can get a little bit more hip flexion and depth with, with my secondary hinge at that point with that RDL. And then I'm hitting, you know, potentially a single leg RDL later in the week on the phase, or I'm looking at, you know, the, the ham curl of some kind, where I'm working through that shortened hamstring position. So it's like over, that's what I always try to tell people is like, it's good to train muscles through full ranges of motion, but that doesn't mean that you have to do that in a singular lift. Like I can stress my hamstrings within multiple ranges with three to four different lifts throughout the course of a week. And for me, that just works way better than doing like a, a hamstring day or trying to work through every single exercise, like full length and full shortening position and then work through those ranges of motion. Yeah. And some of it is arbitrary too. Like I've posted, uh, probably not recently, but in the past, like doing a, a trap bar or a deadlift off the wagon wheels, which is a higher pick, right? So your mm-hmm. handle height is 16 yep. on the trap bar is 16 inches, which is pretty high. And people are like, Oh, well, that's like cheating because the handle's so high. I'm like, but if you can get a heavier load and it puts you in a better position, there's no like competitive trap bar lifting. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm cheating who like, 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 I'm not competing in this sport. Right. (laughs) That's when you find out there's a lot of people on the internet that are competing with you that you don't even know exist. Yeah. I was like, like, I I get that all the, they're like, Oh, you're doing touch and go, or, Oh, you're doing like a high handle. I'm like, it's just my workout, man. Like it doesn't affect what you do in any way. Like keep doing your thing. Like it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll yeah. So. Yeah. Cause for a while I did a uh, like 490 on um, farmer's bar handles deadlift and yeah. people are like, Oh, well, but that's easier. Cause they're at your side and it's like a 14 inch pick instead of 12. I'm like, who cares? Like there's no, com- <laughs> maybe sometimes you see that in a strongman event, maybe, yeah. but usually it's farmer's walks. You got to walk with the damn things. Yeah. You know, but it's just, it's just such a weird thing. (laughs) What I tell people now just to end the conversation right away. Cause I like, I'll post a, I'll post a trap bar deadlift like once every two weeks or so. Yeah. Sometimes every week, depending on how frequent I'm posting and at least once a month, somebody will like DM me or comment on the post. Why (laughs) do you trap? Like, why do you trap bar? And I literally answer them back now. I'd say, because it's easier. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like why why would i not want to get a higher load for more reps right like it's just yeah. why would i not want to get that stimulus like if i'm not bound by a barbell specific sport well there's all kinds of other tools that i can use to to train more efficiently like why would i not do that you know and i think that's people just get so stuck in that mindset where it's like everything they need to do is like a barbell. It's like, no, like go Swiss bar bench press, go SSB squat, like go trap bar deadlift. Like if you're not on a barbell sport, like do what feels better for you, if that's what feels better and then progress it. It's just training. It's not a big deal. So. 
Yeah. If I could go back in time, like I would have bought a safety squat bar like infinitely sooner than what I did because I wasted so much time <clears throat> just being a s- stubborn a hole trying to back squat, not having the best mechanics on it. Like, and, and the funny part is I got to a point once where I, I literally know a lot of people who are really good in biomechanics. So I sent in my video to all these people. I was like, Hey man, do you mind looking at my back squat? They're like, yeah. I'm like, what do you think? And then across the board, everyone is like, looks pretty good. There's not really any weight on it, but other than that, it looks pretty good. <laughs> Only one person asked me, how did it feel? Yeah. And I'm like, it felt like dog shit. Like like horrible. Like horrible. <laughs> like, like if I didn't know anything about mechanics, I would swear that that was the worst list I've ever done in my life. Uh-huh. But yet physics wise, it, it looked okay because what I was doing was forcing myself into mm. what was the best lift by physics and just throwing my whole anatomy under the bus. I'm like, ah, screw it, figure it out later. And I'd always end up with shoulder pain, hip pain, neck pain. Like, you know, and I couldn't figure out why it's because I'm being an idiot is why <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same boat where I didn't start. I never used a, an SSB until really probably like four years ago, you mm-hmm. know, and it's like, I'm, I've been training for 20 years now since I was yeah. 18 in college. Right. So it's like, I've, I used the barbell exclusively for a very long time. And, and I threw in front squats here and there. And, and yes. again, like, I've also got three screws in a wrist that makes that not feel great either. And, but there's, there's videos. I've got videos of me where like my chest is on my thighs, <laughs> like doing, doing like low bar back squats. Yeah. And, and I got to where like, I, like I could squat like 455 for five, nice. you know, like, but it's like, I was literally doing just the world's worst good morning. Like it yeah. wasn't squat it was absolutely awful and everything hurt all the time Mm -hmm. and i just but you just keep forcing it because you don't you're stubborn or you don't know better or whatever so i'm the same way if i wouldn't like had access to or thought about or just uh, been less rigid maybe in my own beliefs like i could have saved myself a lot of frustration over the years if i just would have uh, switched to an ssb like 10 years ago it just would have been a much better situation and it's a weird thing too, because like, even now, just recently, I'm still shaking my head because you like to think that you learn from some of your previous lessons. And then some days you realize that you just don't. So recently I've been squatting more, especially the last year and a half since I've been home, haven't been traveling, been able to train in my gym, which is awesome. And for whatever reason, I got it in my head that, you know, because there's a camber on the side. So if I have the handles down, the camber moves so it's not out in front as much, right? Mm-hmm. If you move it up, it's it goes forward. So it's a little bit more like a front squat, you know, not to the extent like the transformer bar is, but because of that slight camber, it moves the weight forward. So I got it stuck in my head that, okay, I have to have the handles down because that's going to move the load back more. And rep stuff felt good, but like heavier stuff just, just did not feel good at all. And I mean, anyone who's used a safety squat bar before, I, I often joke that like in general rep stuff will feel pretty good, but if you get to like a one or two rep max on it, it feels like a gorilla jumped on your back and just trying to force your head into your own asshole. It, it, like, it feels it, horrible. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Like we, we, Matt works with a, a power lifter in Australia who like, he's won like the Australian Arnold's and stuff. He's incredibly strong. He's probably top five or 10. Like, like I think I know who you're talking about, but yeah, he's, he's a thousand kilo total guy. Like he's, he's incredibly Crazy. strong and like he'll do SSB and it's just like, he looks like a turtle, like literally <laughs> like when he's doing it and it's just the most uncomfortable looking thing you've ever seen. And, and anytime I'm the same way, anytime I've ever done anything like near maximal loading on an SSB, like it feels like someone's trying to rip my back apart. Like it is right. absolutely <laughs> terrible. It's like the the crunch from hell basically, you know, and I just don't know if there's a way around it. Cause you get to a point where because of the camber, the weight will just like drag you forward. Like yes. it'll end up like there's this weird, like bell <laughs> curve where it's like, okay, when it's pretty light, like I can use the weight as a counterbalance to like get my rib cage back in space mm-hmm. a little bit and feel pretty good. And, 
but there's a tipping point for everybody where it's like that weight gets enough to where it just pulls you straight forward yeah and does the exact opposite effect for people so i think it's like like i'm in the same boat that like sets of six and eight and 10, like they're not fun, but they're manageable. Yeah. Right? I don't think anybody likes a set of 10 of squats, but anytime that I get lower than that and get, you know, upwards of like 80 plus percent one RM or something, whatever that might be, like it gets really uncomfortable really fast for me. Yeah. And my mistake was then I kept having the handles down because I'm thinking, God, it already feels like my head's getting driven forward. I don't want any more weight forward than what it is. Yeah. But again, same thing. Like I didn't take into account my anatomy and what else is going on. And then one day I just wasn't thinking and I had the handles up and it was just a heavier percentage. And I was like, what was weird is that felt harder, but yet better. Better. You know, that that weird (laughs) sensation where, yeah, the lift was harder, but I felt okay about it, you know? And so then I realized, well, maybe I should be doing them with the handles up. And I'm like, oh, all of a sudden I started progressing again. But it was a weird thing where, the lifts felt harder, but yet they felt better, right? They felt like I had to put in more effort, but the quality just like, it just agreed with my body a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, I should probably listen to my body and physics are just sort of a guidepost because everyone's going to be different. And again, I'm not competing in like the safety squat bar (laughs) lift. I'm using it to transfer to other things. So does it really matter if I have it in a quote unquote, a little bit more of an inefficient pattern, like no, and it worked better for me. So I'm just going to keep doing that now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've been, I went through a phase, my last phase, uh, two phases ago where I was doing a little bit of like potentiation prior to my bigger, to my primary lifts. Right. So I had a pin squat and like a high pin squat, not a low Mm -hmm. pin squat. And then I had like banded trap bar before my trap bar and so on and so forth. And so I'm doing the, the higher pin squat, which ends up being kind of like a, a quarter squat ish type thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's just all, it's all like concentric and you can overload it a little bit and you can move it pretty fast because you're, you're kind of just yeah, good leverage. You're, yeah. You're on top of the sticking point, right? Like you're not getting, you're just above parallel. And that was another one where like people came out of the woodwork and I'm like, well, if you do like one slide over on Instagram, you see me doing like my normal squat. After that, <laughs> right? like, it's just like, but, but people just lost their minds and you know, it's just like, yeah, there's no safety squat bar Olympics. Like right. it, it, it ends up being kind of crazy how much other people care about like your training, you know, yeah. and that's something that's weird. The inter- <laughs> yeah. The, I think the internet has made it really strange uh, where it's just like, I like the access and it's, it's a huge part of our business to be able to promote that way and market that way. But it's also at the same time, just like, uh, you don't know my goals. You don't know what, again, like you see like a a snapshot of like a singular session. You don't even know, you know, we just talked about a concurrent model, how that session mixes in with everything else that's happening during the week, what my phase looks like. Cause I'll have people that are like, Oh, like, you only do trap bar. And I'm like, no, I only did trap bar today. This is the fourth, <laughs> literally the fourth hamstring exercise I did over the course of a week. Right. And they're like, Oh yeah. And it's just like, it, it, there's no, there's no context to anything you post. And, it, and it's just like, Oh, like people are, people are like, Oh, have you always trap bar? It's like, I've been lifting for 20 years. I did barbell deadlifts for 15 of them. Like, no, I don't yeah. always trap bar deadlift. Like now I do because it's just an easier movement for me. And it, meets the goals right it meets the demands that I'm, I'm trying to hit so it's always interesting when you start getting like feedback from people that just don't know what your actual like plan of action is or what what the strategy looks like and um it's just yeah you're like why why are you even commenting on this like why why you know so it's it's strange it's a, it's a weird phenomenon for sure yeah and even the potentiation is interesting i didn't post this picture yet but <laughs> Before I did um, safety squad bar the other day, I have a camber bar. And so I'm like, hmm, if I play around with potentiation, yeah, I can do like what you suggested, go higher with that. Mm. But I'm like, could I get by with less weight in a different position? Because it's normally, quote unquote, my core, my upper back, that's going to be probably the, the limiter. So mm. can I do something to potentiate that with a little bit of axial loading? So I ended up taking a camber bar and put it in the rack and then did it as a zercher, just as mm. a hold for, you know, 10 seconds. Yep. So can I hold this 
you know, can I move it out of the rack? Can I stand there? Can I breathe, you know, under low? Cause I'm not going to hold my breath for 10 seconds. You know, and obviously if I can't do that, then I knew mechanics wise, there's, there's something, you know, red flags, you know, mm. going on. And with the Zercher, because you're holding it in the crook of your elbows in the front for anyone who's ever done that, the whole weight is in front of you and it just wants to basically pull yeah. you onto your face. You know, so I'm like, oh, okay. So this is kind of simulating with just a change in position of the load mm. of, you know, what my weaker point is. So when I got to doing uh, safety squad bar stuff, I'm like, oh, everything felt a little bit better, like glute contraction, everything. It, it just felt easier. Um, and I used a little bit less uh, warm ups too. So, but again, if you were to post just a picture of a static hold at the camber, just 265, people are like, well, why don't you lift it? You dumbass. Like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Ah, this uh, face palming, this face palming. Now it's, yeah, I, I like that too. And that's, we played around a lot with, you know, Zurchers and, you know, cause again, they're brutal. Like, well, and, and, but they're really great for people who especially like shoot their hips up early. Like, yep. again, like for, for like a taller lifter, cause you just cue them. You're like, Hey, just push the knees forward, you know? And then like, is, and, and, and then try to like, actually like stand it up. And, uh, but they'll, they'll get people and anyone who tries anyone who like just again shoots their hips up too early or if that's if that's kind of the the limiter and what they do is like quad strength or something of that or adductor strength of that of that focus like they'll just dump it forward they can't hold it you know and you mm -hmm. see it so it ends up being like this really good self-limiter for a lot of people where it's like you find out what load you can manage real quickly because like you said it's uh as soon as you get to a point where you're like getting more horizontal with the upper body, like your biceps aren't holding. It doesn't matter if it's 135, it right. doesn't matter if it's you know, 405, like you're not holding it there anymore. Like you're going to dump it forward. Um, so we, we use that a lot with people and, and that's, I've never used it as a potentiation set, but that's actually something that would make a ton of sense for my limiters as well. Yeah. Being a so that's, I like it. That's a, that's a super good idea. Yeah. And I've gone back to, doing zurchers off the floor with an axle bar just because it doesn't hurt as bad mm -hmm. and then forcing myself to set it down on the tops of my quads put my arms underneath <laughs> and then i've yeah. even been even more weird lately where i've been doing you know one two three to five second pauses in the bottom position with the weight like on my knees and again no pain or anything like that because one of the positions i'm missing is that bottom heavily dorsiflexed knees mm -hmm. in front and I'm like, so if I can hang out in this position without any pain, then I'm probably, at least for my goals, I'm getting a little bit more benefit from it. Obviously, you've got no stretch shortening then if you're coming up out of the bottom, out yeah. of a pause. Um, so I've been playing around with those uh, lately, and that's um, not fun, but seems to work. <laughs> yeah, I even look at it. It's like the, because that's always the thing, like when I talk about like exposures with clients, it's like there, there's obviously the physical and the, and the physiological, but I even look at like something like that is there's like a psychological exposure that happens with that. Too, oh, yeah. Where, you know, you, you build the confidence where, you know, you do go into your, your squat set at that point. You're like, hey, like I just sat down in this with the load, feeling manageable, squatted out of it after an extended pause. So me going into like my, my squat set now and more of like a one, one tempo or two, one tempo, like mm -hmm. this is something that I should be able to manage pretty well. And that confidence goes a long way with a lot of people. And, yeah. and, and I think that's something that, you know, again, it's not measurable for, for our purposes. So it's not something that, you know, we talk a lot about from, from a, a coaching perspective, but, but building like the, the self-efficacy and the confidence to, to do that through, isometrics and through some of these other things, I think goes a super long way with a lot of, a lot of the clients that I've worked with in the past, where it's just like, they've been there, they've kind of suffered in that position. And I'm like, Oh, this is it. me just squatting it now is actually easier. Yeah. Like, even though it might, <laughs> it might even be like a little more weight, but now that I have a continuous range of motion, I'm not dealing with pauses and I'm not dealing with like ISOs. Like this is actually an easier thing for me to accomplish now at this point. Yeah. And again, my context, it always goes back to what, what are your overall goals? Like what is the thing you're driving stuff towards? Like, so for me, especially now, before I leave to go kiteboarding, it's more, can I make things look more kiteboarding specific? Right. And so people are like, but 
a zercher pause at the bottom that doesn't look anything like kiteboarding but i'm like if something really bad happens and i get dropped 15 feet out of the sky and i land on my board <laughs> you know do do i have at least hopefully some strength in my legs to decrease that acceleration before my ass goes through my board <laughs> you know what i mean can i put myself in a bottom position in a pause and take away any momentum and have enough strength to reverse that in a safe and you know static mm -hmm. load in the gym there's no guarantee that that's going to save me but yeah it's better that i could do that than not do it right i'm oh, probably yeah. getting closer to reducing that potential injury too so yeah it's, it's that's all preparation is like yeah. again it's like it's um there, there's no it, the the term like sport specific is though i think is the most misused oh totally term like in, in probably strength and conditioning right where it's like people look at sports specific as ability or skill right and they try to match like lifts to look like the skill and, and that's where you end up with like people like trying to shoot jump shots with medicine balls and stupid stuff like that. <laughs> when in reality, it's like the, the sport specific aspect of training is really just looking at, okay, what, what stimulus are you going to be under? And do you need to be able to operate within what exposures do you need from a sport specific perspective? Like what planes of motion are you working in? Do you need to be able to decelerate force and accelerate force? Yep. Like, what do those things look like? Because that's going to be what's actually going to prepare you for that task. And, you know, so it's like sports specificity exists, just not in the way that the industry sometimes portrays it, you know? And I think that's where a lot of the confusion exists where it's like, okay, if I'm looking at running, you know, one of the big things I've been looking at is, okay, like I do need, like, I'm not as an extended person who leads with his chest on everything he does. Like I have a hard time, like, in early stance, decelerating through a heel with a lengthened hamstring. Mm. So I can turn that into a single leg RDL with like a toe elevation, right? Or a toe off position. I can turn that into a barbell RDL if I want to really uh, lengthen position under a higher stimulus. Like I can find things that move my rib cage back in space, like an SSB squat on a cambered bar or something of that nature. So I can find exercise selections that will drive the the postural or physical or physiological qualities that I need, even if they don't necessarily look like the sport itself, they're training the qualities that the sport demands. And I think that's where there's like a huge misconception sometimes with how that's described for people. Yeah. Well, the two things I always think of is in the gym, if we look at running or sprinting, right, are you really doing anything where your limbs are going to hit that velocity in the gym? You're, you're just, you're just not. Yeah. You know, but like you said, maybe the first thing I look at is can you decelerate and break whatever motion, right? Can you have the eccentric strength in order to not tear yourself apart, right? And like you said, with the toe elevated, you know, RDL, whatever, can I increase the eccentric load in the gym so that when I go to do my sport, I have a greater capacity. So doing my sport now is going to be easier and reduce that overall risk potential then too. Yeah. And that's, I think that's exactly what it is, right? Cause like you said, it's, especially sprinting, we're not smarter than our nervous system, you know, at no. this point. And I think it's like your body's only going to go as fast as you can stop, you yep. know, in, mo in most cases. Right. So it's like, if you can increase the capacity to decelerate, you can probably increase your ability to accelerate as well over time. And, and again, like, obviously if, if you want to get better at sprinting, you need to sprint. Yes. But from, and you know, so that, that's obviously that that's a ca caveat that we're acknowledging, but just from a pure training perspective, it's like, okay, I also need to work on these other capacities to ensure that if I am, you know, going to go all out, I don't, you know, pull my hamstring or rip it straight off my pelvis, like on, on my, on my second set of like, you know, 50 yard accelerations or 50 meter accelerations or something. Um, and I think that's, that's where, again, it's like the, the sports specific training is training the the, the way that I look at it with clients from an assessment perspective is it's like, okay, the, the first thing that we look at is your task and what are the task demands, you know, from a physiological perspective, from a physical perspective or a movement perspective. And then we assess your abilities against those demands, right? Do you have the capacity? Can you produce enough force? Can you get into the positions needed, right? To, 
to produce to you know again like move laterally or, or move or, or sprint or whatever and then the training is everything in between like the training is just bringing your limitations to a point where you're confident within those task demands and you know sometimes it's just the task itself and and other times it's also not only the task but it's like the new the new uh standard is like who you're competing against yeah because right? that actually you know that has to be considered too and so that's what we you know i kind of think about when i'm looking at that where like sports specificity will you know be subjective too because you we are going to address limiters we are going to address the things that are actually keeping this person from the absolute success that they're looking for from that perspective from a competitive perspective and and that's where i always look at it too it's like when people are like, you know, uh, all clients are athletes or everybody's an athlete or it's like, well, everybody can do things that are athletic, but very few people actually compete. Right. In anything. And, and I think that's where like competitive I, athlete is different. Yeah. Like that's, a, that's a completely different thing. Cause that changes, you know, everything you're doing inside the gym and outside of the gym, you know, for a lot, cause a lot of people want to train like an athlete, but a lot of people don't want to live like an athlete. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that. Those are two very different things, right? So it's always interesting when it, like those conversations come up with people. It's like, yeah, we can train athletically, but as soon as we start talking about like being a competitive athlete, like we can't just look at like training tissue qualities. We have to look at task demands and the people you're actually competing against and your abilities respective to those things. And that's going to change your training significantly from that perspective. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for all your time today. Really appreciate it. I know you got to head out, but uh, where can people find more information about you? Yeah. So um, probably the easiest place is Instagram. So it's just compound performance with an underscore. Um, we are working to get our YouTube content up to speed. That's our kind nice. of our next project for the, for the next year. So that'll just be compound performance, you know, YouTube channel. And then our website is www.compoundperformance.com. You can always reach us there as well. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Kyle. Really appreciate it. Always wonderful to chat with you. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other again in person sometime soon. I, I hope so, man. Thank you again for having me on. Cool. Sounds good, man. We'll see you. See ya. Bye. Thank you so much to Kyle for taking time out of his busy schedule to be on the program. Always love chatting with him and getting to hang out and and lift in person whenever possible. Make sure to check out his information on the web at compoundperformance.com. He's got great stuff also on the old Instagram there. Go to compoundperformance underscore, and you'll be able to find out more about him. So big thanks to Kyle again for coming on the podcast. And as always, check out the Flex Diet Certification opening up for the last time this year, October 18th through the 25th. Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. If it is during that time period, uh, you'll have all the information on how to enroll and sign up. If it is outside that time period, you'll be able to get on the wait list. So you will be the very first to be notified via the daily newsletter. So go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you could do me one last favor, if you have not subscribed to the podcast on your favorite podcast player, that would help me out immensely as that helps out with the rankings as far as I'm able uh, to tell. And better rankings allow us to uh, get more guests, higher level guests on the program for you. So thank you once again for listening. Really appreciate it. Talk to you again next week.